As you know, there's a big push to go vegan or plant-based. Ostensibly, this is better for your health and the environment. But in today's show, we're going to talk about a recently published randomized crossover study in 16 elderly subjects finding that a vegan meal does not increase muscle protein synthesis to the same extent as an omnivorous meal. I think this is really important to recognize because we understand the importance of muscle mass for longevity, for strength, for blood, sugar, and metabolic health as you get older. And this recently published study randomized in a crossover design 16 subjects to eat either an omnivorous meal or an isocaloric matched and protein matched omnivorous meal. And they tracked markers of blood glucose, insulin, amino acids, as, as well as muscle protein synthesis. Uh, these subjects, I feel bad for them. They were in the lab for two full days. Uh, there was a crossover design, as I mentioned in this particular study. Uh, the protein was matched based upon their body weight, which I think is really important. And the protein sources were from whole real foods, which is, again, really important. And they did uh, four different, I think, four, maybe five muscle biopsies uh, before the meal, right at meal time, and then two muscle biopsies after, finding a 47% increase in muscle protein synthesis on the omnivorous meal. Now, these are elderly subjects. The subjects, you know, were between the ages of 60 and I think 75 or some such thing. But it's important to acknowledge that we look at the amino acid composition of our foods. So let's dive into the study titled Higher Muscle Protein Synthesis Rates Following Ingestion of an Omnivorous Meal Compared with an Isocaloric and Isonitrogenous Vegan Meal in Healthy Older Adults. As I mentioned, 16 subjects in total. Some of you might say, well, that's a small clinical trial, Mike. Well, this is pretty invasive. As I mentioned, these people went to the lab for two full days. They had a continuous IV in looking at markers of phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine, amino acids, glucose, insulin, got a total of five different muscle biopsies after each meal, whether they were in the, on the vegan meal, then they crossed over and did the omnivorous meal. So, you know, we don't need tens of thousands of subjects in a particular study. But essentially what they found is that the omnivorous meal increased muscle protein synthesis 47% higher compared to the vegan meal. I think there's a, many other additional takeaways from that. And uh, what the scientists say, we were unable to detect significant increases in muscle protein synthesis rates following ingestion of the vegan meal. The postprandial muscle protein synthetic response following ingestion of the more traditional omnivorous meal was 47% greater when compared with the vegan meal. But these data clearly demonstrate that simply looking at the protein content of the meal does not provide proper insights into the bioavailability and functionality of the meal-derived proteins. This is important because when you go to the grocery store and you see plant-based whatever, Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger, and so forth, they highlight the protein content, but we should really be looking at the amino acid composition of the protein, not just the total protein. Furthermore, the scientists say the data imply that even when part of a complete meal, animal-based whole foods provide an accessible source of meal-derived amino acids, thereby stimulating muscle protein synthesis rates. We know there's many important benefits to stimulating muscle protein synthesis. There's this phenomenon known as age-dependent anabolic resistance. So as you get older, your amino acid synthetic pathways and anabolic pathways become a little bit desensitized, so we need more stimulation so that we don't lose muscle mass. We know loss of muscle mass and strength are independent proxies of poor longevity, higher prevalences of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and the like. Okay, so here's figure one. This is a graphical abstract of the study methods, which we're going to get into very shortly. So leading up to the meal, there was muscle biopsies, there was continuous blood samples looking at amino acids, uh, leucine, isoleucine, markers of muscle protein synthesis, and then there was a muscle biopsy at the start of the meal, and then two in the six-hour window, one at three hours and one at six hours after the meal. Then the next day, the subjects uh, crossed over and ate the other meal. Now let's talk about the composition of the meal that you can see here in figure two. The plant-based meal consisted of quinoa, chickpeas, soybeans, broad beans, and soy sauce, providing 0.4 grams of protein per kilogram of body mass. Again, everyone's trying to figure out what is the ideal amount of protein per meal or per day. It really depends on your lean body mass. So I think it's important that these scientists acknowledge that heavier people might require more protein per meal to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So again, um, there were isonitrogenous amounts. So the protein was matched between the vegan meals 
and the uh, omnivorous meal group. Now, what was the source of the protein, you might wonder, on the omnivorous meal? Well, it consisted of lean ground beef, string beans, potatoes, applesauce, and herb butter. So again, the macros were very similar in terms of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, but the sources of the amino acids differed, as you might have noticed based upon what we've been talking about. So we're going to continue on about these details and talk about the nuances and talk about why it's important to measure your glucose at minute 60 after your meal and also at minute one, uh, two hours or 120 minutes after eating, because we'll look at these graphs here shortly. But first, I just want to thank you for being here. If you're enjoying this video, please hit that like button. If you have a friend, family member, or colleague at work who may benefit from hearing this message, that different protein sources have different amino acids and thereby impact muscle protein synthesis different, please share this as a direct text message that goes a long way. Now, since we're talking about different nutrients found in plants versus meat, one nutrient that is omitted from virtually all plant-based foods, well, there's two, there's taurine and creatine. That's why we created the novel creatine containing electrolyte sticks by Myoscience. This is the only creatine product on the market that features real salt paired with electrolytes. A lot of people are taking electrolytes and creatine, mixing them together. This is done for you. You have 2.6 grams of the Crea Pure material, which is the only non-Chinese derived creatine on the marketplace per serving 2.6 grams, as well as taurine, potassium, magnesium, 300 milligrams of real salt, not that fake artificial salt brine salt that many of our competitors are using as well as magnesium and calcium. So you can save over at myoscience.com. There's close to 750 reviews that you can read if you want to see what other people, how they're benefiting when using this around exercise, usually before or during exercise. And you can always save using the code podcast over at myoscience.com. There's a new unflavored version that has zero uh, sweeteners like monk fruit or stevia and zero natural flavors. So again, save over at myoscience.com with the code podcast. Okay, so we already talked about the study design uh, and so forth. You saw the graphical abstract. So let's dive into the study findings and highlight what the scientists say. They say, to date, nearly all studies evaluating the muscle protein synthetic response to animal-based compared to plant-derived protein ingestion have assessed multiple protein synthetic synthesis rates following the ingestion of protein isolates or protein concentrates. So that's typically what you see in these studies. They'll compare a milk protein concentrate to a soy protein isolate or pea protein isolate and look at post-meal muscle protein synthesis rates or post-meal leucine or DL-phenylalanine and all the, all the like. But again, this is a whole food study. And I think that's important because many we're eating whole bro foods. We might supplement with protein post-workout or um, you know periodically, but we want to see how do these whole foods with the whole food matrix, you know, the fiber, uh, the the uh, anti nutrients that are found often in plants such as wheat or soy. Now the scientists say, in contrast, our daily protein intake mainly originates from whole food protein sources of both animal and plant origins. In light of the global protein transition towards more plant-based foods, the contribution of plant-based protein sources in our diet is likely to increase progressively over the coming years. The matrix in which proteins are embedded in whole foods differs substantially between plant and animal protein sources. They say plant-based whole foods typically contain many anti-nutrient factors, which needless to say, we've done many videos on how to minimize the anti-nutrients in plants and plant-based foods in other videos, which I will link in the description below. Some of these anti-nutrients include dietary fiber, trypsin inhibitors, that's mostly found in soy, and phytates, as well as oxalates and others, that lower protein digestibility and as such may compromise the postprandial rise in circulating amino acid concentrations and reduce the subsequent capacity to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Really important point. So they go on to say protein ingestion stimulates muscle protein synthesis rates and represents a key factor in maintaining skeletal muscle mass. The muscle protein synthetic response to protein ingestion is driven by the postprandial increase in circulating essential amino acid concentrations with leucine being of particular relevance. Most plant-based foods are pretty low in leucine. That's part of the problem. As such, the scientists say the anabolic properties of protein are largely determined by the amino acid composition of the protein, not just the total amount of protein. Really important because many uh, vegan activists that I see on Instagram 
they're promoting like wheat protein concentrate, uh, setan and all these different things, which have a lot of anti-nutrients and phytates. So you're probably not absorbing much of that protein, especially in a post uh, exercise setting where you need those amino acids to fuel muscle protein synthesis. The scientists say several studies have observed that the ingestion of animal derived proteins, such as dairy proteins, results in greater postprandial muscle protein synthetic responses when compared to the ingestion of an equivalent amount of plant derived proteins, such as soy or wheat protein, which I just mentioned. The lower anabolic response to plant-derived protein ingestion has been attributed to their lower digestibility and incomplete amino acid profile, characterized by deficiencies in leucine, lysine, and or methionine contents. So with that as background and context, let's look at some of the figures, starting out with figure three, which is the post-meal glucose and insulin levels. I think this is just important you know, to know. You know, If you look here at when you have a mixed meal, when does your glucose and insulin generally spike? Uh, around 60 to 90 minutes. And so this is just... Noteworthy, I recommend to my clients that I coach that they should get a glucometer. I like the Abbott. Uh, there's the Precision Extra. There's all sorts of glucometers. Just find one that you can get the strips at locally at your local drugstore. But as you can see here, uh, both meals increase glucose and insulin, right? We know that. This is a mixed meal of carbohydrates and fats uh, as well as protein. And so there were actually more significant increases in glucose on the plant-based meal versus the omnivorous meal. Um, I'm not, we're not going to split hairs over this, but there was a statistically significant greater increase in glucose uh, in the plant-based meal. Not a big deal, but it peaked around 60 minutes and it started to drop down around 90 minutes. Okay. Now, if we look at insulin, there was a significant, statistically significant increase in post-meal insulin around minute 60 after uh, both meals. But the meat-based meal or the omnivorous meal had slightly higher insulin levels. And we expect that, right? We know that there's insulinogenic amino acids uh, in animal-based foods. And so that's part of the reason why after you exercise, you should have a meal that contains adequate protein as well as some glucose to replenish muscle protein synthesis as well as glycogen that you depleted in the exercise session. So just remember if you're going to do non-fasted blood work, have a meal about an hour before you go to the lab and get your glucose and insulin tested. I think that's important to acknowledge, but you see those levels drop down. Now let's look here at figure four. This is where things get particularly interesting. What do we see here? We see plasma essential amino acids. Just to remind you, what we're trying to differentiate here is the omnivorous meal, which is uh, indicated by the dark circles and the open circles are the plant-based meal. You see significant changes in essential amino acids at time points between, and it peaks around 200 minutes after the meal. So roughly about three hours after the meal. And this is why people, lest I remind you, recommend quickly digestible protein immediately after exercise. A lot of people like to uh, promote whey protein and so forth immediately after exercise and having a whole meal because it takes a while for your body to break down those essential amino acids in the uh, whole food uh, complex and to start incorporating those uh, into the muscle protein synthesis pathways to help your muscles grow in the post meal. Because you see, it takes about three hours for these amino acids to peak. And then we also see in figure four here, we see leucine and isoleucine, plasma uh, leucine specifically. We know that uh, to be one of the most powerful stimulators of mTOR, a mechanistic target of rapamycin that helps with muscle protein synthesis. So I think uh, that's important to acknowledge that there are significant differences if you do the area under the curve here between the omnivorous meal versus the plant-based meal dramatically different uh, rates of leucine concentrations as well as essential amino acids now this is not surprising we expect this because plant-based foods generally don't have high levels of leucine and essential amino acids this is not surprising but again it's important to acknowledge that we consider the entire food matrix and the elements of food and the types of amino acids. Now, where things get really interesting is figure seven. Figure seven highlights the muscle protein fractional synthetic rates, the FSR. And so this is where the muscle biopsies come in. And I want to thank all the volunteers of this study for uh, undergoing the painful aspect of getting the muscle biopsies before the meal and after the meal. So we can see here is there were significant differences in the muscle protein fractional synthetic rates uh, between the two different groups. And so you see here, obviously, because of the amino acid profiles after the omnivorous meal, you see significant increases in muscle protein synthesis, and, and it's about 47% difference. So uh, a huge difference there, and that is probably because of the lack of anti-nutrients and the presence of essential amino acids that stimulate mTOR and help with muscle protein synthesis. Now, you might be saying, well, why does all this matter? Well, we know that muscle mass naturally starts to decline with time. We know that especially after the age of 65, there's this phenomenon 
known as anabolic resistance. So if we want to preserve muscle strength and live independently as we get older, we should all strive to eat whole real foods that maximize muscle protein synthesis, especially if you intermittent fast or uh, you're worried about living independently or you don't want to fall and break your hip or, or be immobile and all this. And so that's what we're seeing here is eating an omnivorous diet will help to optimize muscle protein synthesis. So uh, in conclusion, the scientists say the omnivorous and vegan meals provided both 0.45 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Ingestion of both meals resulted in a prolonged plasma essential amino acid response. Time to peak levels was 195 minutes in the meat-based or omnivorous group versus 200 minutes in the plant-based group. So not that significant five-minute difference here. Now, they go on to say that despite the relatively similar essential amino acid contents of both meals, we observed distinct postprandial plasma essential amino acid profiles. Postprandial increases in plasma essential amino acids and leucine concentrations were substantially higher following the ingestion of the meat-based meal or omnivorous meal versus plant-based meal. So there was a 127% increase above baseline in the omnivorous meal versus just a 25% increase above baseline in the plant-based meal which is quite profound. Now, again, why does this matter? Well, the researchers say older individuals typically show a blunted muscle anabolic response to protein intake, known as anabolic resistance. In support of our findings in older adults, it seems to agree with our previous observation in which we did not detect measurable increases in muscle protein synthesis rates following the ingestions of 35 grams of wheat protein isolate. So again, many older individuals are actually having more soups, and salad and going on vegan diets because they hear about the purported health benefits of a plant-based diet. But we know that that is probably counterproductive for maintaining and preserving muscle tissue, which has so many health and longevity benefits. All right. They say the postprandial muscle protein synthetic response following ingestion of the more traditional omnivorous meal was 47% greater when compared with the vegan meal. Our findings may not translate to all whole food vegan or omnivorous meals, but these data clearly demonstrate that simply looking at the protein content of a meal does not provide proper insight into the bioavailability and functionality of the meal-derived proteins. Furthermore, the data imply that even when part of a complete meal, animal-based whole foods provide an accessible source of meal-derived amino acids, thereby stimulating muscle protein synthesis rates. Now, in conclusion, the investigators say a more plant-based diet will likely provide health benefits, with many of those being secondary to lower energy intake due to the high fiber content and satiating effect of consuming more plant-based whole foods. However, the anabolic properties of each main meal may be of key relevance to stimulate muscle protein synthesis rates and as such, to support muscle maintenance. This may be of particular importance for older adults, as the age-related loss in muscle mass is at least partly attributed to the attenuated postprandial muscle protein synthetic response to acute feeding in older compared with younger subjects. A strictly vegan diet may, therefore, compromise the ability to maintain muscle mass in older adults. Long-term interventional studies are warranted to assess the impact of shifting towards a more plant-based diet or adhering to a strict vegan diet on muscle mass. So what are my thoughts on this? Well, as you get older, you want to maintain your muscle tissue because muscle is, as I've mentioned numerous times on these videos, uh, very important to living independently. You work with anyone or ask anyone in healthcare, the key reason why people start to become deconditioned and have dementia and diabetes and obesity and hypertension and heart failure and all the sequela that is linked with uh, aging in this country, in particular in the US and Canada, is because people people don't have enough strength to get up and go to the bathroom to take care of themselves, to feed themselves, to feed their pets or, or whatnot. And so they need healthcare workers to assist them in wiping their rear end and going and getting groceries and just doing basic activities of daily living. So I think it's important as you start to age and you get older to focus and optimize muscle tissue <clears throat> as well as metabolic health. And it seems that if you eat a whole foods diet that contains protein sources derived from animals, including eggs and dairy and yogurt and meat-based products and fish, that's going to be more supportive of, of maintaining muscle tissue in compared to just having uh, wheat and soy and corn and uh, some of these other uh, vegan-based proteins. And we now have a whole food study, one of the first studies of its kind, not looking at uh, food isolates, but looking at the whole food matrix and finding that the whole food matrix is more supportive of maintaining muscle tissue and muscle health. So those are my thoughts there. Can you build muscle on a vegan diet? Possibly, but it seems that the anti-nutrients, the fiber, 
and accessory factors here might impede the muscle protein synthetic response. And so those are my thoughts here. I want to thank you for tuning all the way in. I will link this video in the description below. And if you enjoyed this content, please hit that like button and be sure to share this video with a friend and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.